Good evening. I'm Courtney Graham with the Engagement Department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to today's virtual artist talk with Jordan Castile. We're so glad to have you joining us virtually, and we certainly hope this digital format can offer a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home. This program is being recorded, so if you'd like to revisit it in the future, you'll be welcome to do so. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Jordan Castile has rooted her practice in community engagement, painting from her own photographs of people she encounters. Posing her subjects within their natural environments, her nearly life-size portraits and cropped compositions chronicle personal observations of the human experience. Castile received her BA from Agnes Scott College and her MFA from the Yale School of Art. In 2020, Castile presented a solo exhibition titled Within Reach at the New Museum in New York. Other recent institutional solo exhibitions include Jordan Castile Returning the Gaze, presented at both the Denver Art Museum and the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Center for Visual Arts at Stanford University. She has also participated in exhibitions at institutional venues such as SF MoMA, MCA Chicago, Baltimore Museum of Art, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, MoCA Los Angeles, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Castile is also a, an associate professor of painting in the Department of Arts, Culture, and Media at Rutgers University. Joining Jordan Castile today is Jordan Carter, Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Art Institute. Thank you both so much for being with us. And now I will pass things over to Jordan Carter. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and welcome, Jordan. It seems like it's uh, Jordan times Jordan this evening. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's so great to have you here and to be in dialogue. And we're just so thrilled to have your, your portrait of President Barack Obama titled Barack from 2020 on view in our contemporary galleries and as a promised gift of Rennie collection. Um, so maybe we can just dive right in and talk about how this portrait came into being. Um, as I understand it, it's your first commission and it was commissioned for The Atlantic um, in 2020 for Jeffrey Goldberg's article, Why Obama Fears for Our Democracy. But so can you just sort of talk about that process and sort of what compelled you to sort of accept this invitation to do something that's sort of different from what you normally do? Totally. Well, first and foremost, love Art Institute of Chicago. It's really a pleasure to have this opportunity. All of you have been so wonderful in making this happen and all the people who are joining that I can't see, but I know are bringing energy to this space. I really appreciate. And especially talking to you, Jordan, it's it's a real joy and pleasure. But I, I really enjoy the opportunity to talk about this work because it does hold something really close to me as well as being a little different in the context of how my practice has functioned traditionally. This, as you said, was a commission. It, I don't know if it was actually, it was the first of this sort for sure. I had just finished off of the Vogue portrait, um, which was a different kind of portrait in the sense that I was given free range around my subject matter. This was a subject matter was identified for me. And not only was it a subject matter, it was one of the most iconic subject matters in my kind of young life. Um, the importance of who Barack Obama is and was um, to many of us, I think, stood at the forefront of me accepting this kind of offer. It was a joke for many for many years, probably, that I said, you know, I don't do commissions, but if it's Barack Obama or Beyonce, then like sign me up. Um, so when this came <laughs> forward as an opportunity, it was like, oh, okay, I'm doing this. You know, it's it's going to be different, but it's also really exciting. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, these are those are two iconic individuals. Yeah, really I know. It's like, you know, maybe Oprah too would be on my list, but yeah, you know. But sort of also thinking about the commission and sort of that this was a painting that was really experienced by everyone first as an image um, that accompanied this article and that it was a part of something that was going through sort of a media at, outlet and sort of had a journalistic context. Like, how did that sort of shift your thoughts around it, you know, like the idea that this was going to be experienced first as an image and maybe secondarily or later as an object or have a second life. You know, honestly, it excited me. Um, I've always been really passionate about thinking around um, about how work can be more accessible, especially when it is in the fine art context. As someone who works at an institution, I'm sure you're thinking about similar things about how to make 
museums or gallery spaces or traditional art showing spaces more accessible to the general public. But to circumvent all of that, like why not get in their hands via magazine? Why not make it affordable in a very tangible way, a collector kind, a collectible item without it being like a collector owning an individual work? Um, that the power of an individual becomes more of a collective experience. And that was really absolutely at the top in terms of my own thinking around why I wanted to do this was, um, yeah, that it would be accessible. And I love that. I love that it could exist in the digital realm and in maybe a physical copy that those two things could coexist before someone gets the opportunity to see it uh, in person like they can right now at the Art Institute, that they can be a full circle experience of a painting and the way that we're engaging with work in general these days. Oftentimes, I know for me, since like social media is the first time I'm seeing or discovering a lot of my peers work that I'm seeing something um, and being really excited about it. And then it's only later that I, I get to discover it in person. So I'm not falling too far from that kind of lineage of this moment. 100%. Yeah, that's definitely the way in which we've been engaging, especially over the past year and a half or so. <laughs> um, but sort of to return to the subject of the portrait, um, President Barack Obama, as you said, he's extremely iconic. And, you know, in a way, this is a deviation for you because you normally sort of paint people who you encounter sort of in your everyday daily sphere, like people you can encounter on the streets or on the subway are in just various sort of, you know, casual everyday contexts. So what was it sort of like to sort of really shift that and to paint somebody so well known, such a celebrity? I had to make him familiar again. I think that's somewhat of the titling that occurred and naming it just Barack as opposed to President Obama or Obama that I needed to deformalize it for myself in order to approach the subject and the person in the same way that I approach the subject or the person on the street that they're like family that I always think of my engagement with someone I'm whether I know them or not. Um, as an opportunity to re-engage through the act of painting. So this was my opportunity to re-engage with the, the folds in the face or the ear or the colors or the gestures of what makes this man who he is. And um, I, I had to relinquish any pressure, like I had to set it aside. Because if I thought about it too much, this thing would have never gotten done and I would have just probably, you know? It was a moment where I had to take my brain and set it aside and let and really trust, let and trust my hands to do the job that I, I intend for them to do. So when you were painting, did you sort of think you were trying to convey the president or the man, or did you sort of approach it under thinking that perhaps they're inextricably, inextricably linked or? They're definitely one in the same, I think in my mind, it's both and he will forever represent that, that iconic part is him, as president, it is President Obama, um, and where I was the moment he was elected president, and thinking about his term in office, and where I was throughout that journey, and the things that I gained along the way, or maybe lost along the way, and his leadership and reflection around that is just as true as my often considerations around what it looked like to go home at the end of a day as the president. That him as a man, those things are always linked, whether we see it or not. I'm always as a painter, generally really curious about the things that are existing outside of our immediate purview. And I really wanted to consider how he existed as a man and does exist as a man outside of his iconic um, reference points for many of us. And um, I think that's an important part of engaging in terms of like the human experience for me um, and engaging in my painting practice as a whole. In terms of this humanness, I mean, you you talked about, you mentioned that it's titled Barack, not President Obama, not President Barack Obama. Um, but this is something you do with a lot of your portraits is this first name attribution. Like what is the effect that you're going for there? And, and can you just sort of talk about that decision? Yeah, it's um, twofold. One, I'm a horrible namer, always have been. Um, if it was a stuffed animal that was a teddy bear, I called it Barry. You know, like it's like there's a one, in the way that I think I, I engage with the world around me. There's 
a very realist aspect around how I want to see the world and engage in the world. And if somebody is introducing themselves to me, I maybe he would introduce himself to me as President Obama. Um, but in my head or a fantasy space, he would be Barack. And in the rest of my paintings, I am getting introduced to people often on a first name basis, that that is my first point of reference. And I like the idea that this is a, a practice of sharing and it's sharing the people that I've met with other people that I haven't. Um, and that involves giving them access to a, an intimacy that they might not have if they were to walk down the street or say hello to someone, or if they met these people, like what are the things that make our engagement intimate? And oftentimes it comes with our names first and foremost, foremost how we claim ourselves in space um, and want to be seen within that context. So it's my way of kind of making sure that they are always present and, and nodding to the collaborative spirit of these paintings as, as a whole. Um, it's not just me choosing a name for them, it's them existing within a space that I've created with them. Um, so it, I think it's all those things at once. Thinking about this collaboration and sort of, you know, the, this idea of intimacy at, at a distance or via portraiture, I'm curious to hear about, you know, this is sort of different from your sort of portraits in which you're taking hundreds of photographs of, of, your, of your sitters, you know, and some, sometimes very staged, other times more casual. But, um, you know, what was it like to paint from a photograph that you didn't take? And also there must have been, there must be like, thousands of photos in which to choose from. So yeah. how did you sort of decide on your source material? Like, So my relationship to photography is one that I um, do not consider myself to be a photographer, like maybe now being married to a photographer explicitly, I'm like not my, at all my experience or my skill set. Um, but what I, my passion photography for photography comes from is around holding on to the memories of my engagement with people and using that as reference material. So it's opportunity for me to capture the experience that I have with someone, which is why there's so many photographs often taken for me is that I'm looking at and taking pictures of all sorts of things around them. I allow myself the ability to bring into view in the in the compositional frame, things that I saw maybe too, too far out of a traditional photographic frame, that the painting space is one where I get to exercise my memory in its fullest form. And just like my memory, sometimes things are disjointed. It's, you know, that thing wasn't actually as close as I remember it to be, but I brought it here anyways. The things that I thought were really important, maybe were far away. Um, so that becomes the exercise around photography. In this moment for me, seeing, I think in some ways it was a benefit to have someone who is so public that has so many photographs of themselves public and like available that I was um, struggling in some ways to like identify with a singular image. Uh, but I kind of needed a singular image in order to fit the compositional frame that I was after that um, it wasn't, I wasn't able to do the thing where I'm clicking all in one moment. <laughs> Um, so I tried to get a sense of who he is and the energy that he brings and discern from all the images I was looking at a general feeling that I connected to as if I were engaging um, in the way that I do in my traditional practice or in the way that I've generally moved through my practice. And that helped me kind of settle on that particular image because maybe by the end of it, in some ways, I, I felt the weight of being a man such as Barack Obama and that duplicity that I was talking about of the public and the private and him as a man and him as an icon that you kind of see through a whole Google search an array of playing with a dog or his children and his desire to be like my father would be or someone that I know very intimately. And then also someone sitting in the Oval Office making decisions that I could never imagine making decisions around. Um, so I think that that image, I settled on it because for me, it held that weight of um, a general understanding that I had in that moment around what the experience could be, that I wanted us all to kind of have a moment of pause through the act of painting to reflect on further. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Yes, definitely. And like in many ways, like the photograph is a vehicle for making contact or... Totally, totally. And we... Sometimes photographs exist, at least in a familial context, we, they're family members that 
we don't ever meet, but through the frame of a photograph. And there's great power in that. Um, and oftentimes we're playing a game of relation. What, oh, they look like me, or they're sitting like I do, or um, look at that thing in the background. It reminds me of something that I have in my own home or space. And the same thing played out in the context of making this portrait, for sure. So you work from photographs, and this is sort of based on a photograph, but like your your paintings, your portraits are, are in no way sort of representative of that particular photo per se. Um, it's, it's almost like, you know, you're using them as a score or something for a more improvisational method. Um, and I'm just curious, could you talk a little bit about that and a little bit about your, how you see your portraits sort of operating sort of in between sort of figuration or representation and abstraction? I, first of all, I'm smiling because I love that metaphor. Like, yeah, it's a score. Like, it's like, I, it's so true of the experience of the way that I make the work in the sense that I am playing a song for myself. I am um, really thinking about all the modes of music and the tune and the variations that are going to help tell the most complete story of an experience for someone to have. Um, so for me, it is not musically driven. I am quite musically incapable, but in terms of painting, I love color. Color becomes a huge part of my storytelling and how I engage the viewer in a certain way of looking and wanting them to engage or a certain feeling that I want to evoke. Um, the way that I can place a figure within the frame. I think there are many decisions that I make it can seem on the big scale like there's a figure in space but then when you take the time to look in deeply um it can be in a singular moment which is why i love doing the crop paintings is it started those crop paintings started out of a love for looking at the moments within the big paintings that i thought could stand on their own because in terms of abstraction like i felt the lusciousness, lusciousness of my brush strokes very explicitly. I felt my hand, I could see the story. It became very expressive. It became about relationships between colors and lines. It's about the green as it meets the orange or the orange next to the yellow on the face. And when you actually dissect kind of the way his face is painted in that portrait, there's a lot of abstraction that comes to light. Um, that sometimes gets lost when you're looking at just a big portrait on itself. We're automatically connecting just to the human figure on its own um, and not investigating the maker and its relationship to the material. Yeah, it's almost like there's this compression effect or something like that that you're getting. Um, it's almost, it's like you don't get the full body, you don't get the full image, but in a way it almost brings you closer. Um, okay. Which is why I think of the breadth of my practice as being like a sentence um, that I'm using every word. Every word is as important to tell the story. And sometimes those are the smaller crop paintings, the subway paintings, or it's a seated figure portrait, or it's a painting that is indicative of a storefront, you know, that no literal figure is present. So all of those things help to tell the sentence of my experience with paint and seeing the world as a painter. And I want to talk a little bit more about these cropped sub paintings and these subway paintings. Um, these are, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but these portraits are done more provisionally based on iPhone shots and less stage, correct? Absolutely. And, and I'm just so curious. I, there's, Time and time again with your paintings, your portraits, I feel like the hands are drawing me directly in. Um, mm -hmm. And the, what we have on screen right now is one of the subway portraits called Class. And it seems like you're actually, you know, through the even through the title, you're actually really bringing us to the hands, like their movements, um, the way that they 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 grasp, the way that they make contact. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your predilection for hands? Because I feel like they they really figure prominently in Barack. Um, but also throughout your, throughout your um, oeuvre. Yeah, I, like many things, I think there are um, a lot of reasons why I do the things that I do. They probably all started when I felt like I was really bad at painting hands. So I started painting a lot of hands. <laughs> that's like, that's probably the most honest origin story is that there were a series of years where I felt like I, I wasn't good at drawing hands or I wasn't good enough. and. Um, like the stubborn person I am, when someone tells me I can't do something, I tend to like do push it even further. So I, I spent a really long time investigating the hand 
um, and finding myself thinking a lot about how hands can tell stories on their own, um, how that was the thing that within the context of my big portraits, I would often focus in on that I was most interested in, or I would say that was my favorite part of the painting is these very concrete, but also, um, not super concrete because you're losing a lot of the figure in the context, but tell so much like sitting on the subway and the experience of sitting on the subway, there's this um, tradition of not really engaging with one another in an intimate way. You're looking down, you're enclosing space around yourself in a very public space in order to stay as enclosed as possible. Um, so what I find myself looking at most frequently are people's hands or their postures or asking myself questions like what was their day? What do I think they do for a living? Um, are they stressed? Are they not stressed? As someone who flails their hands around a lot, even in the context of this talk, like I think my hands are very expressive and the way that I use my own hands is very expressive. Um, sitting here with like, you know, like a toy, like I'm always keeping my hands moving. It's just kind of who I am. Um, so it's, it's personal and it's reflective and it's an opportunity to explore emotion and draw people into this like really concrete human thing that so many of us share. Um, I love how in this portrait in particular, there's like the hands get lost. You almost kind of forget what finger you're looking at and where it connects to the palm of the hand. Um, and then the stripes coming down. Also, there's like a similar expressiveness of movement. Um, so this feels really alive, although it's pretty stagnant. Uh, and I love kind of thinking about those things when I'm making the, the crop portraits like this. And if in Barack, it, it feels like the hands are perhaps a bit disproportionate. Is, is, is that, am I, am I reading it correctly? It's possible because, you know, my roots are not doing hands very well or whatever. I lean into, because this is also true, like I have a photograph, but I always sketch from hand first. Like I don't project or um, trace or anything onto the canvas is like, I'm doing everything for mine and I'm doing it really immediately. I love when things are kind of off. I think that it is a, a reminder, not only to myself, but to those who are bearing witness to my practice of um, the imperfections of my own humanity, that I'm really just representing what it is that I see in, in the truest forms. And as a result, some things become, um, uh, what is distorted or, you know, out of place than they normally would be. Because I, then it all comes back to the paint again. It like allows this conversation to flow between I'm not, although I'm a realist painter and that they're very recognizable that I'm not really interested in hyper-realism. So it's possible that, yeah, I mean, maybe, kind of. I see, I see what you see. I hadn't seen it before, but I see it. And I see, I see that. Um, I remember making the painting and thinking like, oh no, I made his ear too big. Like, you know, like it's like Barack Obama and his ears. Like that's, it's like a thing that I like wasn't trying to play into. And then I it's like this one ear, you don't see two, um, which I also thought was kind of interesting. And I loved like, it was the palm on the chin and the wrinkles that are created that look like crevices that, um, most caught me and then just the barely kind of touched on his skin maybe dark circles or inflammation or whatever just kind of like an aging or the weight of skin um feels really present in this and that's what i kind of was after mostly it definitely does like it's like there's this gravity and you can just sort of yeah. feel like the weight and that sense of like the, the contact between the hand and the face or the palm totally. uh, and it's just like it's just it's super haptic and tactile in a way. Um, I want to return to what you were talking about in terms of color and abstraction. And I'm curious how that functions in this work, but also maybe we could bring up actually Jerome, I believe it's slide four, Devin. This is a portrait that's a part of your Visible Men series that you made while at Yale, while, it's, while, um, in, while in your MFA. And I'm just so curious about how color is working in this portrait, how it works in all of your portraits. Um, there's a vividness to it um, and an unrealness to it, but also it almost seems expressively real. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about color, your color choice and it's in the boldness and experiments that you're doing there. I think 
that that sense of like being hyper realist but not um comes into play in that that it is obvious to kind of a quick passerby that i am painting a portrait of a body um laying on a bed potentially nude um but then questions begin to emerge and i love the experience of a viewer engaging with a work where questions where the obvious is called into question um where the things we think we understand um have to be brought back for more investigation so when this started for me, it was thinking about the way that literal blackness functions. And as someone who is fair skinned and is of a family tree where the vastness of the way that skin is represented in the experience of blackness is, I always felt that um, as someone approaches a person of color that they don't always know as much as they think they do um, around what our experiences are. And this is like a, a layer of engagement. I also love the idea that I'm like literally painting, I mean, it's like one, two punch again, but it's like literally painting people of color and using color, somebody who's like always just like loved color. I've always loved Bob Thompson's work, like thinking about how the human form can be as ethereal or as, as um, out of otherworldly as we want. So for me, it's like these are all opportunities for play. And in reality, I, as serious as I am as a, a person, that like playfulness comes into play, literally, double, you know, whatever. Uh, playfulness happens when I'm like using color in unexpected ways and pushing myself to do that and challenging myself to see color differently, um, both literally and kind of figuratively. Definitely. And, and back into Barack, I'm just, I'm curious to hear a little bit about the color choices there and, and that, that sort of lush sort of almost, is it mint green? I, I it's like, I can't even quite just, you know. Like, yeah, it's like neon, mint green, it's something like an aqua on, you know, next level aqua, you know. Um, I, I think as we're talking about the weight of his hand, I had finished the painting his figure first and um, I felt the weight in some ways after I made it and I, I wanted there to be more balance because my experience of looking at all those pictures and thinking about my relationship to who this man is to me, there was also a lightness. I always felt like there he was walking on air in some ways, the way that he kind of glided through space uh, in my kind of recollection of it, right? Like that's my experience of how I was seeing him as the president. And I still see him kind of navigate the world that there's a significant amount of gracefulness involved and um, an optimism that this year has been very difficult to see at times. At this moment in particular, the pandemic was still quite heavy as it is right now, but I felt particularly kind of confined in my own space. Um, and I wanted this to just be not just heavy, but light. Um, and the perfect balance to the yellow and the red in his skin for me was that green. And it was as bright as I could make it. It was like a challenge to myself to figure out how to make that neon out of, you know, oil paint. Um, and I think it, ultimately was achieved. Um, there is this like tender balance between sort of that heaviness and that weight and that sort of ethereal lightness sort of behind him. So that's definitely okay. super successful. Totally. Um, I want to talk, I mean, obviously, you know, with the Obama portraits up right now at the Art Institute, we're thinking a lot about presidential iconography and portraiture and power. I, I'm curious, you know, during the time that you were painting this portrait, did you look at any other presidential portraits or you know is that something that was on your mind at all no i i was really trying to forget how important he was you know what i mean like i was actively working on like not thinking about it too much which meant that if i was like studying the history of what i i, I would have <laughs> like i totally would have folded and been like sorry i came over i fold um so for me i was really actively at this time not um although there is great admiration, especially for the work of Kande Wiley and Amy Sherald and respect for those portraits. I mean, that was 
contemporarily speaking, the most intimidating factor in making this portrait because honoring the work that they've done and being really respectful of the their engagement with it um, was super important for me. But I also knew, as I think is what's the most beautiful thing about artists in general, is we can all be looking at the same apple and paint it very differently. Um, so I knew that my voice would be additive. It wouldn't be destructive no matter what it was. Um, and the best thing I could do was be as authentic and true to myself in the experience or in the portrayal of it as possible and not overthink it. So like I did stay away until it was done. You know, like now contextually, I'm super engaged and thought like trying to be thoughtful about how it fits in. But prematurely, I had to, I had to, Kind of put my head down and burrow and make it you know it's kind of funny like the, the two portraits are so distinctly complementary yeah it's also interesting about kahende's portrait is that you know the president president obama is looking right at you and here his eyes are closed and it's a very different mood and a very different you know um mode of engagement i'm, I'm curious to hear about that decision to choose to choose to portray him with his eyes closed yeah, it's really, it goes aligned to the thing that is most authentic to me and the way that I do these crop portraits or paintings is there is a layer of distance oftentimes between me and the person that I'm portraying or the environment that I'm portraying. So from like class, when we were looking at that and you don't see a face or the kind of context, this is similar in that you don't see, I don't have full access. It's a nod to my acknowledgement and knowing that um, I can't see this moment entirely. Um, and I know that, and that's why I chose this image. It was like, there was always going to be limitations and I needed to be aware of what those limitations are. And the actual knowing of him was not going to be in my immediate experience. Um, so I didn't choose an image where he was looking back because he actually hasn't looked back to me explicitly you know what i mean whereas all my other subjects have if they're if they're looking out in the paintings it's because they're actually looking back at me um and if they're not then i try to honor that by not representing that um and this falls right in line with that part of my practice or those values that i hold that's really real mm -hmm. um i'm curious you know maybe at the time or even maybe now if you consider you know painting a president a political gesture or any more political than painting the likeness of anyone? That's an interesting question. I don't, I haven't considered that explicitly. I didn't think about it in that moment in that way. For me, I think it could, right? I think there are presidents, he was highly politicized, there's no question, but I think as another person of color maybe, um, I, in the naming of it Barack, like I, I was really entering the space outside of the context of his political career. I was entering the space as a person, um, person to person in my experience of him. I think there's great potential for them to be political. And I think I, I might've hesitated if it would have been because I am, although I, I have, highly strong, like very strong political opinions that I think of my painting practice as being kind of my sacred space in meditation. There are things, things are usually quieter here for me um, in the painting practice and they're more subtle engagements. And I guess painting him wouldn't have been subtle at all. I don't know, I haven't thought about that. They're absolutely, I think like talking out loud as I'm working it through. Mm -hmm. um, it's an exciting and interesting notion that it could be. And I'm, I'm very curious within myself why it didn't feel like it was, is what's happening. I'm like, hmm, it didn't yeah. feel like that. It could be, I could see how it could be. And it didn't feel that way. No, um, it's extremely genuine and I'm, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Um, I'm curious just before we turn it over to, to Q and A, just to talk a little bit more about portraiture in general and your relationship to it. Um, you know, like, do you consider yourself a portrait artist? Do you see like any sort of um, value in that terminology or any currency in that um, categorization? Or like, what is your relationship to portraiture as a notion, if you will? I 
consider myself a pain. Like I describe myself to people in the world when it's like, hi, I'm Jordan. What do you do? Like people who I'm meeting for the first time, maybe it's like, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm like, I'm a painter. That's usually my like self described way of engaging with the world around what it is that I do. And then when they say, oh, what do you paint? Um, it's like, I paint people. I sometimes paint like landscapey scenes. Sometimes I paint people on the subway. Like I don't, I think a portraitist, I think my pushback around it is the way that it has historically functioned art his like in the art canon um, and finding a place for me to fit in the way that I paint and where my story and body fits into it. I like I struggle to find my place within that, um, at least in the art historical context. Um, so like to be a portraitist, I feel like it's like there's more rigidity, rigidity to it than I think I am as a person. Like I'm generally like, hey, what's up? Like, can I paint, you know, like it's like very conversational. It's very um, expansive. I think who I paint or how I paint or what represents a body, it's, it's really more about, if anything, I probably would be more inclined to call myself like a landscape painter these days. Like I'm out here painting whatever it is that I see in the landscape of my life. You know, it leaves it so broad that no one's ever going to know that I can ultimately do whatever I want. Like in my head, I really I'm a painter and I love expressing my observations of the world through the act of putting oil paint on canvas and exploring color and form. That's beautiful. And yeah. I mean, that's a really great way to wrap up, I think. And here we are seeing your form <laughs> and your self-portrait. Mm. Uh, I guess before I turn it over to q and I do just want to ask one last question, which is, you know, although um, the painting of Barack um, didn't involve sort of this collaboration directly and didn't involve sort of this sense of community engagement, um, as it were, um, more typically defined in your portraits in the process of making them, I'm curious, you know, how you see or how you'd like it to function socially, how you like what your um what what your aspirations are for visitors um who see the portrait and and how it might function um on on that sort of social community level sort of within the galleries. Yeah, I think anytime a work of mine is on view for the public, I feel lucky as I'll get out. That is the dream. And the dream exists and the opportunity for others to see themselves just ever so slightly, whether it's in the figure represented or the colors that excite them or the brush stroke that they're curious about. Um, any opportunity for something to be on view, for this in particular to be on view in Chicago at this time with the Obama Portrait Show is the greatest gift one could ever imagine because it gets to be a part of like I write sentences, it's it's kind of the breadth of experiences and definition and defining ourselves in relation to time and history and the people within those moments and particularly the Obamas. Um, and I love that. I love that the way that the work is placed, it's next to a Glenn Ligon, that there's that room, Philip Gustin, like the artists that I have respected who have told and seeing the world through their own lens and through their own ways, told their stories, um, is really, yeah, it's exciting to me. It, it's just another opportunity for a different context. Um, and that's always a good thing. Thank you so much, Jordan. It was really yeah. such a privilege to install the work and to contextualize it with Glenn Ligon and Philip Gustin. It's really a room of just like powerful vulner vulnerability in a way. Um, and I think that, you know, your work anchors it just so, so excellently and powerfully. Thank you, Jordan. I wish I could be there. If I were in that room, I'd probably be crying in the corner and you'd have to pick me up, but it's amazing. And well, I, I just encourage everyone listening to go and see the portrait in person in Gallery 295 in the Contemporary um, Galleries of the Modern Wing. But um, we do have some pre-submitted questions um, from the audience that I'd like to turn to, if that's all right with you. Um, here's one that's quite um, interesting. What is your favorite detail about the painting of Barack? Hmm, I think I have to go back to that like crevice in the cheek. It's this kind of, this pushing up motion that really shows 
the gravity, as you said, and the weight of this moment. Um, I looked at it a lot as I painted it and really liked it. When do you know that a painting is done? That is the epic question. You know when, it, when you move on um, to something else in your life? Usually it's, it's the same thing for me, at least in the studio. Like when I start another painting, then I'm definitely done. If I'm able to like go to sleep and not still think about that thing, or like I'm like checked out in my brain and worried about what's on Netflix, then I'm probably like done with that painting. Um, because the paintings, as I'm like working on them, I'm a... I'm a monogamous painter in the sense that I usually work on like one painting at a time to the point of completion. So I'm like fully engaged emotionally for a chunk of time in one painting and one work. And there is a point where I'm able to say like, I can breathe <laughs> and I can let this, this is, even if there are moments that make me uncomfortable or I'm unsure about that I can rest in that uncertainty and feel okay. Um, and there's a lot of just kind of, there's a point of just knowing. I'm, onto the next thing. Resting in uncertainty, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, another question we have here is, what other mediums um, do you look for, to for inspiration? So obviously there's photography, but I'm, I'm curious if there's any. Art. Yeah, what else? I mean, movies, it's just like friendships. My inspiration really comes from being in the world. I think that's my primary inspiration and this year has been hard because there's been less of that in some ways there have been different forms of it taking place and the forms are are generating themselves as we speak here now on zoom when people are watching on youtube like our ability to touch one another is is expanding but um i think my greatest inspiration does come from like being in the classroom with my students or being out in the world and having a conversation with someone I've never met before. It's, it's really being out um, and having conversations with people and asking questions and getting to know them better. And outside of that, it's like, I love to bake and that inspires me because it's important to like use my hand sometimes outside of painting. Like do you, when I get to exercise my like own um, multiplicity of person, I'm able to bring that all back into the studio usually. You really do sort of position people, you know, as as a medium in its own right. Um, mm. Really fascinating and it really comes through. Um, last question from the audience here is, you know, you didn't mention uh, Bob Thompson, but they're curious to know who are some of your influences and our collaborators. Ooh, I like the word collaborators. That's interesting. It's my contemporaries are in many ways my collaborators, whether we're talking all the time or not. And I think there's a constant sense of knowing of one another or mutual respect. One of the things that I love the most about being a painter in this moment in 2021 um, is the way that we're engaging. There's a real sense of community right now and social media has a huge part to play in that. I think we're always giving each other nods of respect and congratulatory, you know, cheers or saying, I see you and I um, am proud of you. That those are the things that I think are one of the most important parts of where I am in this moment. Um, but some other people, I mean, there's authors. It's, it really, I mean, oftentimes it's literally like, it's like James who I paint, I've painted several times now. Like it's like my nephews um, and other painters for sure. And like Jennifer Packer or, um, Oh, there's so many. Glenn Ligon, Philip Gustin. I mean, they're yeah, like all of the, like everybody for me. I'm not, I'm not a good chooser. I love kind that. of like, like in my paintings, it's like I don't really have a favorite painting. So I just <laughs> like to absorb. I'm a I'm a true observer, like in its most authentic form. Like I really like just watching and engaging um, with everyone. And I just have maybe one last question to close us out, which is, you know, I've really sort of noticed, or at least I'm noticing in this moment, sort of, you know, post quarantine, and as we're sort of all cautiously sort of re-entering the world, that there is sort of this renewed, or at least I, I'm feeling like there's this renewed purchase in terms of portraiture, and mm -hmm. it's power to sort of provide a sense of sort of relationality and contact and empathy. And you know we're seeing such huge crowds here for the Obama portraits, and and I think one of your um, inspirations is Alice Neal, who's had just you know 
lines of people just trying to get into the Met to see her retrospective right now. And I'm just, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like portraiture um, right now and in terms of, you know, the way in which it can really be a proxy for, for actually, you know, connecting. Yeah, I, it makes sense. The way, like nothing about the way people are engaging with portraiture right now surprises me, particularly coming out of this year when it has been so difficult. Many of us estranged from lo loved ones, have lost loved ones. Um, it's a time of needing to reconnect with humanity. I think we're all reckoning with our own in very explicit ways and the ways that we um, our bodies and physicality function in space and our health and our wellness, our way internet, like how we function on an international and national scope. Um, I think there's a real reckoning with ourselves and how our bodies function in space and the delicacy of that oftentimes, the fleetingness of that. And a portrait lasts forever. I mean, it's a really safe space to, um, trust and entrust our humanity and our longevity of experience. It's told in museums all the time from portraits that have been made eons ago of people that we will never know, but we knew lived here. Um, and portraits, I think, still function in the same way of kind of documenting our time and our existence and um, memorializing moments. And this is a moment of real memorializing on many levels, I think, internationally and nationally, um, we're all thinking about it. So like Alice Neal for sure, and all of, um, yeah, the Obama portraits, like none of it surprises me. Like part of me is like, bet I would be doing the same thing, you know, like line me up in this moment, I need it just as much as everyone else does. And I make portraits often, you know, but like seeing other people's portraits and ways of engaging and memorializing their experiences of seeing I don't know. There's something that's really soothing um, about these kind of markings that exist in paintings of our humanity. So true. And thank you for this amazing marking. Yeah, of course. Um, rock. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure to be in dialogue with you. It's always good to have two Jordans on the camera at once. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Thank you so much. Jordan squared for sure. And I just, yes. wanna, yeah, I just wanna thank everyone who's here. And I just wanna encourage you again to come and see uh, Barack and the Contemporary Galleries of the Modern Ring, um, as well as the Obama portraits. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it back to Courtney to close us off for the evening. Thanks, Jordan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you both, Jordan Castile and Jordan Carter, for sharing this discussion with us tonight. Um, this program is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, The Obama Port Portraits, um, on view through August 15th. And of course, um, do go see Jordan Castillo's work, Barack, um, which is currently on view in the Modern Wing. For more information on upcoming virtual events, please visit us online at artic.edu and look for our monthly e-news in your inboxes. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.